was happy because I'm a creature of habit, so I like my routine. Although I was a little confused because the uh, their website didn't really indicate any major changes to the schedule, but I showed up here to find that uh, everything's a little bit off kilter this morning. Go train service has resumed on the Milton line and at Hamilton Go station as a work stoppage at Canada's two major railways has come to an end. Good afternoon. While service is back up and running, Metrolinx has warned there may be some adjustments to schedules throughout the day. Service had been suspended since Friday when workers at both CN Rail and CP Kansas City were locked out. CTV's Raheem Ladani has been speaking with commuters and joins us live with more. Raheem. Nathan and Michelle, good afternoon. I want to direct your attention to this digital sign behind me. We were actually here last Wednesday when crews were putting it up, and it was in, in anticipation for the strike on Thursday, letting commuters know that there would be no GO train service on Thursday here on the Milton Line. That, of course, did roll into Friday. Well, today the sign is still here, only the messaging has changed. It's now telling commuters that service has resumed, and that has been welcome news for those coming to catch the GO. The Monday morning commute is back and somewhat normal for many who rely on GO Transit after what had been a frustrating and inconvenient couple of days last week. It took longer than usual to get to work, um, around 20 more minutes, 30. I take usually the, the train every day to go to work. I'm not working from home. So as I arrive on my like on time, like regular train, I was told that it wasn't working. So I had to take TTC, so I was delayed for work. Last Thursday and Friday, GO service on the Milton Line and at Hamilton GO were suspended. Metrolinx makes use of rail traffic services provided by Canadian Pacific Kansas City. And so when workers went on strike last week, it was forced to stop running trains. People who, were, um, who live in Milton, I really feel for them. Uh, People who live in the west part of Mississauga it would have been more difficult because the buses do take longer to get to this terminal. With the Federal Labor Board ordering thousands of employees back to work over the weekend, GO train service at those two affected lines are once again running. Metrolink says, please note that there may be some adjustments to schedules throughout the day as we work to restore normal service. We will have additional resources available as needed in the event of any disruptions. And disruptions there have been, with some trains delayed up to an hour this morning. I was a little confused because the uh, their website didn't really indicate any major changes to the schedule, but I showed up here to find that uh, everything's a little bit off kilter this morning, which is a bit inconvenient, but uh, we'll survive. Commuters, though, grateful service is back, even if it's not as smooth as they would like. Now, the next set of trains traveling here on the Milton Line will be coming from Union Station, heading westbound at around 4 in the afternoon, and we'll be here to see if those delays have been sorted out. Reporting live, I'm Raheem Ladani. Nathan and Michelle, I'll send it back to you both in studio. All right, thank you, Raheem. Still to come, rail service is resuming across the country. We'll have more on rail workers being ordered back to work a little later in the show. One person has been seriously injured in a shooting in Rexdale. This happened just before 1 a.m. near Finch and Highway 27. Police say the victim was sitting in a white Range Rover when they were hit by bullets fired from another vehicle. They were taken to hospital with serious, potentially life-threatening injuries. Police have not provided any information on possible suspects. And Toronto police are investigating a stabbing in the city's Silverthorne neighborhood, which has left a man seriously injured. This happened around 9 p.m. yesterday near Rogers Road and Regent Street, east of Kiel. Police say a man in his 50s was found with stab wounds and taken to hospital with serious injuries. So far, police have not released any information regarding suspects in this case either. Hamilton police say a potential tragedy was averted at the Winona Peach Festival on Saturday after police arrested a 23-year-old man with a loaded gun. They also say there were three other violent incidents over the weekend, and police are calling on the community to come together to address the violence. As a community, we have to be uh, joined in the fact that we cannot be comfortable with what happened over the last 24 hours. We need, we need to stand up. We have to understand that uh, why would anybody bring a firearm to a festival? We have to work together. We have to share information. We have to be one in creating some semblance of public um, order and public safety. The 23-year-old man arrested at the festival is facing several charges, including possession of a loaded gun. Police also responded to an assault in a parking lot close to the festival where four men were attacking another man with a baseball bat. 
A 53-year-old man was taken to hospital with serious injuries. Later in the evening, there were two shootings outside separate bars, which saw five people, four men and one woman, taken to hospital with serious injuries. Police say there have been ongoing issues with licensed establishments in the area of these shootings, and they will continue to work closely with the Alcohol and Gaming Commission to revoke business licenses at these locations. Police are still searching for a man wanted in connection with the deaths of two women in an Etobicoke home on Friday. 33-year-old Joseph Ayala is wanted for second-degree murder in the deaths of an 82-year-old woman and a 60-year-old woman at a home in the area of Sheldon and Silvercrest Avenues. Police say the women were related to Ayala, while a family member has identified them as his grandmother and his mother. Police released an updated photo of the suspect yesterday. He's described as standing 5 foot 11 with a shaved head. He is known to wear a cowboy hat, a cowboy style jacket with tasseled sleeves and black cowboy boots. Investigators say Ayala is considered dangerous and anyone who sees him should not engage and instead contact police immediately. And a 44-year-old man has been arrested and charged with attempted murder after allegedly assaulting another person with a hammer earlier this month. It happened near King and Queen Streets in Roncesvalles Village just after 9 a.m. August 3rd. Police say the suspect and victim were involved in an argument before the assault. The victim was taken to hospital with serious injuries. Warren Dwyer has been charged with attempted murder and assault with a weapon in connection with the incident. A cyclist is in hospital following a crash in Trinity Bellwoods overnight. The cyclist was struck by a vehicle in the area of Dundas and Claremont Street just after 12.30 a.m. The cyclist was taken to hospital with serious injuries. Police did not provide details about the circumstances leading up to the incident. And two people were taken to hospital after a crash involving a motorcycle and car near Jane and Weston. It happened just before 9 last night. A man and woman on the motorcycle suffered serious but non-life-threatening injuries. The driver of the other vehicle remained at the scene. And the TTC is sharing an update on the status of its subway tracks and related delays that passengers are experiencing. Subway trains have been running slower than normal on stretches of track where the TTC says maintenance is required. A new map of those reduced speed zones shows key stretches of all lines impacted. The transit agency says slowing down trains in those areas lets operations continue safely while minimizing disruptions. Still, the TTC says customers should consider the additional time they may need for their trips. And another busy streetcar route is said to be replaced by buses starting next month. Work to upgrade the streetcar overhead wires along Queens Key and Fleet Street will begin September 3rd. Buses will replace the 509 streetcars from Union Station and Exhibition Place. The TTC says the project will be broken up into stages and streetcar service will resume between Union and Spadina during the second stage in early October. The TTC says the project is expected to be completed by early next Next year. However, the 509 streetcar service will be temporarily restored for a series of Taylor Swift concerts in November. And we've got more news in a moment, but first here's a live look at the city this afternoon. Mainly sunny, hot and humid. A little bit cooler if you're heading by the water and there's also a light wind. It does feel tropical overall. It's dry. Rain's expected tomorrow. Let's take a look at our satellite radar and you can see there's some rain to the west and to the south of us, but nothing really in the Toronto area. There's also a heat warning in effect to the west and south of us, London and Windsor, so bear that in mind. Right now we're above seasonal 27 in Peterborough, 26 in Hamilton, 26 in London, hotter with the Humidex. And right now at the islands, we're at 24, 27 at Pearson Airport, and it's going to go up to 29 this afternoon. And notice once again that Humidex, the UV is also high, so lots of sunscreen. We'll give you a look at the long range forecast a little bit later on in the show. To other news now, the Canadian government is going to impose a 100% tariff on the import of Chinese electric vehicles. Actors like China have chosen to give themselves an unfair advantage in the global marketplace, compromising the security of our critical, critical industries and displacing dedicated Canadian autos and metal workers. So we're taking action to address that. 
Data from Canada's largest port in Vancouver shows imports of vehicles from China jumped 460 percent annually in 2023. That is when Tesla started shipping made in Shanghai EVs to Canada. The Prime Minister also said today there will be a 25 percent tariff on imported steel and aluminum from China. He says his government is looking at further punitive measures such as tariffs on chips and solar cells. The announcement was made this morning in Halifax prior to the first full day of a Liberal cabinet retreat. The Prime Minister also said there will be new restrictions to limit the number of low-wage temporary foreign workers. Starting September 26th, applications in regions with an unemployment rate of 6% or higher will be refused, and employers will be allowed to hire a maximum of 10% of their workforce from the temporary foreign worker program. That's down from 20%. Justin Trudeau says the rules are being changed to help businesses facing labor shortages recover from the pandemic. He says the economy is different and Canada no longer needs as many temporary foreign workers. Housing is a major priority for the Liberal government, and they're now opening up dozens of new properties for lease. However, it's a move critics say should have happened a long time ago. CTV's Christina Tenalia has the details. We're building homes on federal lands. This isn't a realtor. It's Canada's housing minister promoting a government program that frees up federally owned properties to build homes. There are thousands of federal properties in every part of this country that aren't doing much right now. So the Liberals say they'll make better use of these lands. 56 properties the size of 2,000 hockey rinks to be freed up as announced in the 2024 budget. Five sites are ready for builders to submit proposals with the potential for 25,000 units. This location in Toronto's northwest end. The other spots? Ottawa, Calgary, Edmonton and Montreal. The government says the goal is to lease the properties to builders long term. With builders committing to build affordable housing, construction can begin as early as January. The news is good. But not good enough, says this housing advocate. But they also propose doing something like this actually in their 2015 platform. It's moving the right direction in the same way that a turtle is running a marathon. It really doesn't tell you how close you're getting to the finish line. The conservative housing critic doubled down on the delay. Nine years later, five properties are ready to go. They can start building on them. They keep promising and the situation just keeps getting worse. Just this week, a report notes the average home price in Toronto is 1.1 million. In Vancouver, it's 1.2. The average income needed to purchase a home in these markets is between about 210 to 227 thousand dollars. The median after-tax income for Canadian families is about 68000 With an election on the horizon, this expert suggests the government's move to speed up construction may be too late. There may be a number of voters who want to turn the page and get a new government uh, in the hopes that that government will do a better job on that. The government also announced a new tool for builders that allows them to submit proposals. The Liberals say this is all part of their plan to build 250,000 new homes. By 2031. Christina Tenalia, CTV News, Toronto. Rail traffic is resuming across the country this morning after the Federal Labor Board ordered workers at Canada's two largest railways back to work over the weekend. Those are major economic uh, consequences, and they're also major consequences in terms of salaries for unionized workers across the country. So we made what we think was an inter uh, a decision in the interest of workers and many unionized workers across the country. More than 9,000 unionized workers at CN Rail in CP Kansas City were locked out on Thursday after their union and employer failed to reach a deal on a new contract. That shut down freight traffic across the country, as well as some commuter lines in the Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver areas. And for more on the end of the work stoppage, we're joined live now by CTV's Scott Hurst. Hey, Scott, so why did the feds force binding arbitration? Well, Nathan, the workers might be back on the job today. The freight cars may be rolling, but the fight is not over. That's the message from the union. So they are still at this, and they say that they will appeal the decision. And so that is where we stand right now. The freight cars are rolling. The workers are there. But the next step is now binding arbitration, an independent arbiter that will work to 
help all sides involved reach a collective agreement. But from the government's perspective, as we heard from the labor minister saying uh, in the order, putting thousands of railways, uh, rail employees back to work, it's a move to support the country's economy. Also, the prime minister is saying it is a balancing act between letting the sides work through collective bargaining, but then stepping in, they say, when too many jobs and too many livelihoods were at stake. Here's more from the prime minister commenting on the rail stoppage. In this case, we needed to take action after talks had broken down, after uh, the distances couldn't be bridged, uh, because too many Canadian jobs and livelihoods were at stake. Uh, that's why we acted, but we will always uh, be a partner to unions. We will always respect collective bargaining and make sure that that is, uh, wherever possible, the only way things get resolved. Nathan, the Teamsters say they will uh, abide by the tribunal's decision. They will comply with it, but argue it sets a dangerous precedent, saying the rights of Canadian workers have been significantly diminished by the ruling. And with that, how soon will railroads be fully operational? And that could still take days, if not weeks, to get up to uh, full operation. As we saw from the two rail companies, they had already begun a two-week shutdown process, and so that not all fr uh, freight traffic, not all of the rail traffic was happening over the last couple of weeks as they got to the deadline. Now industries across the country will continue to feel the pain as the ripple effect of ramping back up to full capacity will take quite some time now. So days, if not weeks, for Canadian businesses and industries to to continue to feel the effect and get back up to full speed. All right, CTV Scott Hurst, thank you. Thanks, Nathan. A group of uh, commercial dog walkers are expressing their frustration with a new policy that bans them from operating in a downtown dog park. The ban in Ramsden Park took effect last week, and the group of dog walkers has launched a petition calling for it to be reversed. CTV's Natalie Johnson has been following this story and joins us live with more details. Natalie. Hi, Nathan. This is a temporary ban that applies only to commercial dog walkers in the off-leash area of Ramsden Park here. And it comes in the wake of a number of complaints from local residents about the noise that has been created by people and dogs in the off-leash area, as well as the effects on parking in the area, which is already arguably fairly scarce. This comes as the city is conducting a citywide review of the rules for dog parks in various parks across the city. As of right now, some of these parks are open to commercial dog walkers and others are not. Councillor Diane Sachs, the councillor for this ward, asked council in June to temporarily ban commercial dog walkers from this particular park until that review is complete. Local dog walkers, though, are furious at this move. They have started a petition calling for this ban to be reversed, saying they were not consulted, but they do think there is a compromise to be reached here. We started the petition after, I think, a really knee-jerk reaction from uh, City Council, where very quickly they um, banned us from the dog park we've been using for, like, 25 years. Um, and uh, the petition is, uh, we're trying to make a compromise in the petition. So they're trying to ban us completely from the park, and we're trying to tell them that we're only here, really, from 10 to 3, Monday to Friday, like most most days, and um, that we would like to continue using the park from 10 to 3. There are no other dog parks around here for us to use. Dog walking has become a, a bit of a necessity more than a luxury to a lot of Canadian households and certainly the people in the area uh, require their dogs to go out during the day and go to the dog parks and do their business and socialize and whatnot and to take this away from them is uh, is horrible. I mean you know they're they're tax-paying citizens this is their community dog park uh, they should be allowed to use it. I was chatting with Councillor Diane Zacks about this issue this morning. She says she recognizes that there is a sharp division on this issue between the people who live in and around this park uh, and the people who use the off-leash area. She wants to stress that dog owners can take their dogs to this dog park. It is just the commercial dog owners who take multiple dogs at a time who are affected by this temporary ban. She understands that the full review will come back in the first quarter of next year. So as of now, this ban does continue subject to review early next year. Reporting live, I'm Natalie Johnson. Back to you, Nathan and Michelle. Thank you, Natalie.
The federal conciliation process between Air Canada and the union representing its pilots ends today. There will now be a 21-day cooling-off period after which Air Canada's 5,400 pilots will be in a legal strike position starting September 17th. Last week, the pilots gave their union, the Airline Pilots Association, a strike mandate in the event it was unable to negotiate a deal with the air carrier. Pilots have been negotiating with Air Canada since June of last year with wages and scheduling a among the main sticking points. Ukraine's Air Force commander says it was the biggest air attack of the war. Russia launched widespread strikes today on much of the country. Four people were killed and more than 12 others injured in the strikes that also damaged energy facilities. Over 100 missiles and drones were fired beginning at around midnight and continuing through daybreak. Ukraine's prime minister says drones, cruise missiles and ballistic missiles fired at 15 Ukrainian regions more than half the country. Explosions were heard in the capital, Kyiv, where power and water supplies were disrupted. Israel has reportedly launched more strikes on Hezbollah targets in Lebanon today. So far, there's been no repeat of the intense exchange of fire over the weekend, which sparked renewed concerns about a wider regional conflict. On Sunday, Hezbollah launched hundreds of rockets and drones towards Israel, which the group described as phase one of its retaliation for the assassination of a top commander last month. One person was reportedly killed in Israel during the exchange. Israel's military claims it foiled a much larger attack by launching preemptive strikes on Hezbollah targets in Lebanon on Sunday. The fighting has sparked fears of a major escalation in the Middle East. It also comes as negotiators meet in Cairo to discuss a ceasefire in the war between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. Archaeology students are digging up the past in Pickering. The group getting their hands-on experience with tools of the trade. CTV's Carol Charles has the details. It's not your typical summer school program. They learn uh, hands-on. They get to, to excavate on a real archaeological site. Um, they learn all the techniques that would provide them the skill set to get a job in archaeology. <laughs> Alana McCabe is excited about the program and one day hoping for a career in forensic archaeology. Her team has had a good few days. Our unit is a midden, so that means it's a trash pit. So we're finding big chunks of bone just today so far, um, big chunks of ceramic. We found some faunal and floral remains as well. So floral is like pieces of carbonized corn. Um, which is really interesting as well. The students here are learning about the first peoples of Ontario, the Huron-Wendat. So they're learning more about what they ate and uh, how they might have lived and how they might have migrated um, because this was considered to be a summer uh, hunting and fishing camp. And it's really interesting to me to get that glimpse into previous lives that have been lived here on site. Eric Doiron says the field experience is a valuable learning exercise. Yeah, it's very interesting what I'm looking at. It really tells us on like how the people lived and like the kinds of pottery they made. And based on the decorations of the pottery, you can tell like who has been here. The Boyd Archaeological Field School is a residential summer school program that runs for 17 days in mid-August in Pickering, run by the Toronto and Region Conservation Authority in partnership with the Durham District School Board. They deliver a two-credit program, one co-op, the other in interdisciplinary studies in the study of archaeology. They're learning so much and it's such a jam-packed program for them, but they come out with a vast knowledge of something that they would never get in a regular high school and with the hands-on experience to go with it. In fact, they have more hands-on experience than many first-year university students in the field. When you're doing archaeology, not only are you um, you're interacting with the past, I guess, and with that comes a real sense of community. It links you to the landscape, it links you to the people that were here before, um, and that's really important. Next year, the Boyd Archaeological Field School will be celebrating its 50th year. They hope to raise funds to enhance the program. Carol Charles, CTV News. Let's look at the forecast once again. It is cooler by the water, but right now it's still hot and humid, but dry. Rain's expected to roll in tomorrow. And if you are heading out on a patio, it is a great day, above seasonal all day and throughout the afternoon and evening. Lots of sun. Remember, the UV index is high, so sunscreen is advised. 
We'll give you a look at the long range forecast right after the break. Stay with me. Weather is brought to you by the Presler Law Firm. Injury lawyers, you don't pay unless they win. Well, we are coming off just, I think, a spectacular weekend of summer weather, and it continues today. It's hot today. You can really feel it in the air. We've got the sunshine. And did you have some outdoor plans? We were outside the whole weekend. It was fabulous. Yeah, I was outside yesterday enjoying myself outside quite a bit Saturday as well. And, you know, the month is winding down, and we've only got another, what, unofficial weekend of summer until we get into the fall. So enjoy it while you can because things are going to change. But we can at least say that the long weekend is something to look forward to. We're expecting dry conditions for the most part. Yeah. We can look at the conditions right now. We've got heat and humidity. That's one thing. But at least uh, it's above seasonal if you like the hot weather. So right now across the province, hot temperatures 28 in Timmins, 24 in North Bay, 27 in Toronto, but it feels like 32 here. Uh, for the highs, 28 in Peterborough, 29 in Toronto, 30 in Waterloo. So above seasonal pretty much everywhere you look and even hotter with the Humidex. It'll cool down a bit tonight, 16 in Peterborough, 19 in Toronto, 17 in Waterloo, but still uh, above normal. Looking at the forecast radar, nothing much going on right now, just a few clouds, but eventually some rain's going to roll in tomorrow, and then after that, a lot more rain rolling in tomorrow afternoon, and then right into Wednesday. So off and on, but showers are coming, and you know, if you've got a lawn, let's say, front and back, this is good. You don't have to worry about watering it. And then the rain kind of leaves and then returns again. So for today, looking at the seven-day forecast, lots of sunshine, the high 29 degrees, but it's going to feel like 35. For tomorrow, early in the day, expect some rain to roll in. Not a washout, but some, the high for 30, uh, 30 degrees. And then more showers on Wednesday, possibility of thunder showers as well, the high 25. A bit of a cool down Thursday, but mainly sunny, the high just 24. And then Friday, we're getting back to seasonal temperatures, chance of showers, the high 27. And then the weekend is looking pretty good. A high of 27, lots of sunshine for Saturday. And for Sunday, the first of the month, we're expecting lots of sunshine as well. There's a slight risk of showers. Of course, we're going to look at that throughout the week, and uh, hopefully holiday Monday is pretty good as well. All right, we'll give you a recap later on in the show. Well, back to our news. Frontline workers gathered at Queen's Park this morning to express their concern over the province's plan to close 10 supervised consumption sites. Five of those sites set to close are here in Toronto when the province has announced plans to replace them with what they call recovery hubs, where drug use will not be allowed. CTV's Queen's Park Bureau Chief Siobhan Morris has been following this closely. She joins us live now with the latest. Siobhan. Well, this was a really emotional news conference with those frontline workers talking about the good they've seen done at these centers. And they say what the government has essentially done here is signed thousands of death notices. They say that people will die with the closure of these sites. What's more is they emphasize that we will see more needles, more overdoses in places like public parks, in bathrooms, at restaurants, forcing some of that work onto people who don't have the proper training and are not emotionally equipped to deal with things like overdose deaths. Here's more of what we had to uh, what we heard from some of those frontline workers. We cannot have moral ideology and discrimination be the backbone of public policies. A few vocal critics who will not be satisfied until they are closed, knowing full well people will die as a result, should not be setting policies in this, pro in this province. The government is creating a false dichotomy between evidence-based treatment and evidence-based harm reduction. One of the comprehensive responses to the drug death crisis have been supervised consumption services. We need to expand them. We need to fund them. One of the things that we heard emphasized today is just how difficult it can actually be to get into something like a rehab center. There are many restrictions and the finances are a barrier as well. Today in London, we did hear the premier double down on this policy, saying that, do, that these uh, centers are really creating more harm than doing good. Reporting live from Queen's Park, I'm Siobhan Morris. Nathan and Michelle, back to you. Thank you, Siobhan. We turn our attention to sports now, and the Blue Jays will be looking for a fifth straight win when they take on the Red Sox today. He hits it to deep right field, and it is gone. The Jays wrapped up a four-game series with the Angels yesterday. They homered twice to secure an 8-2 victory and series sweep. The Jays will now open a series with the Red Sox, beginning with resuming a suspended game from June 26th at just after 2 p.m. The teams will also play a second game this evening. Now, former Blue Jay Danny Jansen is set to make baseball history today when he'll become the first player to suit up for two teams 
In the same game, Jensen was in the Jays' starting lineup on June 26th against the Boston Red Sox when the game was postponed because of rain. In July, Jensen was traded to the Red Sox and will be in their starting lineup when the postponed game resumes this afternoon. Jensen was also at bat when the game was postponed, meaning the Jays will have to pinch hit for him when things resume. Still to come, defying the aging curve. New research is offering some insight into how people age and ways to limit the impacts. We'll have those details when we come back. It's been said creative people see the world differently, and there's new research providing some scientific evidence to support that claim. For more, we're joined by CTV Science and Technology Specialist Dan Risk. And great to see you. Happy Monday, Dan. This Happy study Monday, has you thinking about creativity in a whole new way. Tell us more. Yeah, this uh, this blew my mind, this one. Because when I think of a creative person, and I, you know, I try to be creative, but we've all worked with people or met people that are just, you know, they blow your socks off with what they come up with. And it seems like the creativity happens when they're creating. And that's what sets them apart is how they interact with a blank canvas. But... This new research shows that those people who score high on the creativity scales are different at other times, too, when they're taking in information. One part shows how the brains of, uh, of creative people interact with new information, and they show that those creative people take strange, oddball examples in stride, and they're able to incorporate them really easily. But the second part of the study I found a little bit motivating in terms of how I might change my own behavior so I can become more creative. And that is that creative people tend to want to spend their time doing a diverse array of activities, many of which they don't particularly enjoy, which is a little weird. Um, but if you're the type of person that just has a routine and likes to do the same thing and enjoys what you do, and you're not getting outside of that routine, you may be robbing yourself of some experiences that might make you more creative when you sit down to that blank canvas. So uh, a really helpful study and really interesting to me. Mm, agreed. This next study is about why legal documents are so darn hard to understand. It turns out the answer has to do a little bit with magic spells. Explain this for us. I love this one. My brother's a lawyer, my dad's a lawyer. I've got tons of lawyers in my family. So any opportunity to make fun of them, I jump at. And this is about how legal documents are sort of impenetrable, the way they're written. And, and the fact that they're so com complicated that even lawyers have more difficulty understanding their language than understanding other kinds of text. And one key piece of it is something called center embedding, when the sentence has a clause in the middle of it that explains a definition or something that goes off in a totally different direction and then comes back before you're finish the sentence and you finish the original thought you were making. And it's very confusing. And legal documents have tons of this. And so researchers tried to figure out why that is. They tested a couple of different hypotheses. Um, and what they finally came up with is that the purpose of it is to make the legal documents look important. They're just for show. Just like a magic spell has, you know, rhymes and, and rhythms to it that make it seem like an incantation so that in medieval times, people who heard a magic spell would know something special was happening. <laughs> Legal documents are exactly like that. They just sound really important for the purpose of sounding really important, but not actually making them work any, bit, any better. And so there's a real movement afoot to, to take that ridiculous language out of the legal stuff, especially since most of us need to know what those laws say. Yes. So this is all just to justify what we're paying the lawyers. I'm kidding. <laughs> I but think so. That's what I tell my brother. Yeah, I've exactly. always thought it could be so much simpler, right? Oh, I love that. Yeah. I love that study. Glad someone looked into that. Yeah. Finally, mm -hmm. let's get this in. Um, turns out venting about a friend might not help you feel better, but it could have another benefit. What did researchers find? Yeah, this is interesting. Everybody does this, right? You're, you're talking to your friend and you have like a, you're, you're, something happens. And then the next day you go talk to another friend and say, oh, my, my, that friend over there is driving me crazy. They, they did this, they did that. You vent. But confusingly, we've known for decades that that doesn't actually make you feel any better. There's nothing about venting that makes you feel any kind of relief. It doesn't make you like the other person more. So why do we do it? And this new research shows that it might have to do with the way that person who you're venting to perceives you and the other person. If you do it in a way that makes it very clear that you're not the aggressor and that you harbor no ill will towards the person you're venting about, it can have the effect that it makes people like you more and it makes them like the person you're venting about less. And so that might be the explanation for why it's a human tendency for us all to do it. Wow, you've given us so much to consider and ponder. <laughs> CTV science and tech specialist Dan Riskin, thanks for your time today. Have a great week.
You too, Michelle. Thanks so much. Bye. Well, aging is often thought as a slow and steady process, but a new study suggests people age dramatically in two accelerated births. CTV's Genevieve Beauchemin has more on why it happens and what can be done to limit the impact. New wrinkles, aches and pains of aging, it turns out, do appear overnight, particularly in two peaks, one at the age of 44, the other 60. It's not to say that there isn't change in, across the entire lifespan, but those two periods seem to have rather, you know, strong bursts, if you will. A new study looked at humans on the molecular level over several years and found major changes at those <laughs> ages. But they're very different, though skin and muscle aging happens at both milestones. Lipids were big in the 40s. Uh, in the, I remember in the 60s, your immune system decline is a very big deal. That's not something Janet Santos, who happens to be 60, totally believes. And then 60 years old is a drop. What do you think of that? No, I think when you continue doing exercise and eating healthy food, you can be the same. And there's something to that, say scientists, ways to slow down getting old. In your 40s, focus on your lipids. Go on statins if need be. In your 60s, your immune system and your kidneys. I would argue drink more water for your kidney function. Certainly a lot of things you do for your immune system, meaning exercise is good for everything. Overall, the advice is to take particular care of yourself around these pivotal moments to stay as youthful as possible. Geneviève Beauchemin, CTV News, Montreal. Former Oasis members Liam and Noel Gallagher have, te have teased a possible reunion of the band. Today was going to be the day, but they'll never throw it back to you. The brothers, who have not performed together since 2009, posted identical videos on their social media accounts. The videos include the date and time, August 27th, 8 a.m. Liam Gallagher also shared several news articles reporting rumors of a reunion. Next Wednesday marks 15 years since Noel Gallagher announced he was leaving the band following a dispute with his brother. Still to come on CTV News, Canada's main stock index was up in late morning trading, setting the stage for another record. We'll have the details after this short break. Get Toronto's top stories, breaking news alerts, and watch live. Download the CTV News app. As students prepare to head back to school next week, teachers are preparing for how they will manage cell phones in classrooms. Teachers unions across the country are expressing concern and confusion about the new rules and how they'll be implemented. CTV's Kamil Karamali has more. Backpacks, binders and books. But there's one item some parents are happy not to have on the back to school shopping list. I totally believe that the phone is a distraction in the classroom as well. New cell phone bans ringing in the school year. Teachers, though, calling the new rules confusing. We're going to spend more time policing cell phones than actually teaching. The cell phone bans in classrooms are different across the country, depending on the province. Ontario has a tiered system. Cell phones must be put away until grade six. After that, it's up to the teacher to determine when it's used. There will be a lot of inconsistencies across the board. Manitoba allows any student past grade eight to use their phone only outside of the classroom during breaks. Both Saskatchewan and Nova Scotia have bans during class time for all grades. This September, Alberta students won't be able to use their phones in class except for health reasons. But each school division has been given until the new year to create their own policies, similar to BC, where each school district has its own rules. And that becomes a problem because sometimes you could have one set of rules in a school that is literally across the street um, from another school that has a different set of rules. Education policy experts worry the new rules are being put in place too fast with not enough of a transition for students. Well, ideally, there would be time for discussions with students to get full buy-in. And no support for teachers, possibly leading to educators not bothering to implement the ban. So they didn't receive support from school administrators when trying to enforce these rules, and they didn't receive support from parents. Teachers asking for for smaller class sizes and teaching assistants to help with enforcement, while some provinces instead adding funding to mental health initiatives to counter the effects of cell phone use. Kamal Karamali, CTV News, Toronto.
The town of Collingwood is offering residents a cash incentive to add additional units to their homes. The town is relaunching its rapid additional residential unit initiative. Financial incentives are being nearly doubled to $10,000 for property owners who build an additional residential unit, or ARU. They're re also required to rent it out year-round for a minimum of five years. ARUs are smaller residential living units, which can be within the main dwelling, like basement apartments. They can also be detached from the home. Collingwood says smaller units are a more affordable option and are more frequently rented than primary dwellings. Canadian stocks move higher this morning, putting the benchmark index on course for another record high close. Andrew Bellaby and Bloomberg brings us the latest in business. Hello there. Here are your business headlines. Toronto's Composite Stock Index topped 23,325 today, set for a new closing high. The benchmark is ahead about 11 percent so far in 2024, shy of the 18 percent gain for America's S&P 500. Energy stocks rose this morning as oil was lifted by new Mideast violence. Gold stocks as a group slipped, even though bullion hit a new record above $2,500 US an ounce. But the precious metal stocks have soared 30% so far this year. If you're hankering for a Chinese-made electric vehicle, get set to pay up. Canada will impose new tariffs on Chinese electric autos, lining up behind Western allies and taking steps to protect domestic manufacturers. The government announced a 100% levy on electric cars from China and also 25% on Chinese steel and aluminum. The surtax on vehicles will take effect October 1st. And finally, shares in NVIDIA, the maker of chips used for artificial intelligence, have soared 3,000% in the past five years. The company reports its latest quarter on Wednesday. The rise in the shares has made millionaires of many employees, but Bloomberg says they have little time to enjoy their wealth. Work hours are grueling and high stress. The CEO, Jensen Huang, has set expectations, Bloomberg says, of scrappiness and overwork with a chaotic reporting structure. One former employee said he was expected to work seven days a week, often till 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. That's the latest in business. I'm Andrew Bell of BNN Bloomberg. Coming up on CTV News, chasing a Paralympic dream, a rower from Saskatchewan is hoping to reach the podium in a new sport after having his promising hockey career cut short. We'll have the details when we return. The Paralympics are set to begin Wednesday and a number of Canadians will be trying to reach the podium. The medal hopefuls include a rower from Saskatchewan who turned to the sport after being injured in the 2018 Humboldt Broncos bus crash. CTV's Allison Bamford reports. The water is Jacob Wasserman's new arena. It's a bit of a thrill too to be out there and on the water and doing things that I wasn't doing before I was injured. The 24-year-old found para rowing by chance and just so happened to reach the pinnacle of sport in only his second summer on the water. We were kind of planning for L.A. and prepping for that and then just kind of got lucky. Wasserman qualified for Paris back in March, one Paralympic cycle earlier than he was ready for. He knows how to work, for sure. Long before rowing, Wasserman was chasing his dreams of professional hockey. The former Humboldt Broncos goalie survived the tragic 2018 bus crash that left him paralyzed from the waist down. But his drive to compete never went away. I've always wanted to try to push myself to be better than what I was the day before, and rowing's no different. It's a, it's a sport that you get out what you put in. I find the harder you work at it, the better your results are going to be. And he puts in a lot. Two sessions a day, six days a week, some of the hardest workouts of his life. His times are competitive, and for his first summer games, he just wants to put up a good race. He's demonstrated a capacity to achieve the speeds that we need to achieve, ultimately. Now, now into Paris and beyond, it's about doing the work necessary to sustain those speeds. 
Wasserman will compete in the PR1 singles event, a 2000 meter race at the end of the month in front of his family who plans to be in the crowd in Paris and his former Humboldt Broncos teammates who will be cheering from home. Oh, those guys are my biggest supporters. They've uh, sent lots of sent lots of words saying that they're uh, they're pumped for me and they can't wait to to watch me out there. Support he says will be felt all the way from Paris. Allison Bamford, CTV News, Regina. All right, here's another live shot of the city as we take one final look at the forecast. It is hot, it is humid, but it is cooler by the water, so that is good if you're out there. Uh, looking at the satellite radar, really nothing happening, just a few clouds here and there, mainly west of us, but nothing in the city. Right now it's hot, well above seasonal, 28 in Oshawa, 27 in Toronto, 27 in Waterloo, but with the Humidex, it feels like 35 in Oshawa, 32 in Toronto. That's the trend for today and tomorrow. If you're heading out to the X, it's a great day for it. lots of sunshine. It is warmer, feels like 35 once again, and also the UV index is high. So again, lots of sunscreen if you're heading out and um, otherwise enjoy yourself there. Looking at the long range forecast for today, the high 29 degrees, we're almost there. And then rain's coming in tomorrow. Chance of showers in the afternoon definitely looks like we're going to get some later in the day. It's also going to be humid tomorrow as well, the high 30 degrees. For Wednesday, thunderstorms are expected, more showers, the high 25. Slight cool down on Thursday, mainly sunny. The rain leaves us, but then it returns on Friday. But the highs go up, back up to 27 on Friday. Weekend is looking dry for the most part, highs of 27 and 25. And that is a look at the long-range forecast. And that is CTV News at noon. Remember, you can get Toronto's breaking news all day long on CP24 and at our website, ctvnewstoronto.ca. For all of us here at CTV News, have a wonderful afternoon. I'm Michelle Dubé. And I'm Nathan Downer. Be sure to join us later for CTV News at 5 and 6. Take care.